Canadian shows before. So uh, I'd like to welcome him back to the virtual stage this time. Unfortunately, unable to see you in person, Kevin, but good to hear from you. Um, hey. So Kevin is, is from Skillco, and, and he will be talking today about advanced Facebook and Instagram ads for direct to consumer brands, perhaps one of the most cost effective and best way to get your messaging out there. So um, please take notes. Uh, this will be a very valuable um, uh, seminar for just about everyone out there who owns a brand. So uh, Kevin, the virtual stage is yours. We will have Q&A at the end. So anybody please uh, post questions in the chat function. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction, Jason. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, do, you, do you guys see me? I tried activating my camera. Okay, now there we you... go. There you are. Yep. Awesome. Here I am in my kitchen. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to share my screen with you in a second. But first, I just want to introduce myself and thank everybody for you know, taking the time to join today. Um, so here, I'm going to share my screen. Let me know when you see, see this. Oh, so host disabled attendee screen sharing. Um, how do I do this? One, yeah, let me, uh, let me in one second. Let's try to troubleshoot this. I think you're supposed to be a part panelist. Let me see. Oh, oh, no, no, try, please. Let me. Um, yeah, one second, we're, we're troubleshooting that here. There's actually less uh, tech issues on virtual than we've had in live. So right. like on, on, on site, surprisingly. So that, that's, a, that's a positive thing we're finding from the virtual platform. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good news. Um, hold on, let me see. Okay, I think you're good to go now. Try it one more time. Okay, perfect, here we are. Perfect, awesome. there you are. So let me, where did I go, slideshow. All right, cool. So guys, today I, I wanna talk to you guys about Facebook ad strategies and tactics for direct-to-consumer e-commerce brands. Um, so I'll get into a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about me, who I am, and then I'll get straight into the interesting stuff. So I started Skill in 2015, um, probably even earlier than that. I started off as a freelancer 2013 and 14 when it was very, very inexpensive to run ads on Facebook. And so my freelance business sort of transitioned into more of a consultancy slash agency, um, specifically for direct consumer brands in the fashion, fashion apparel, um, beauty and health space. And so um, today, what I wanted to do is just unpack everything that I've learned, everything that I currently do for my clients um, on Facebook ads, all the strategies, tactics, um, I just want to unpack everything for you guys so that you leave here um, way better off, whether you just want to get started dabbling in the ads manager yourself, or if you have an agency running your ads for you, or if you have an internal employee running it for you, um, whatever your case is, um, hopefully you leave, you know, after this call, you um, are way better off and uh, you can implement some stuff, or some things I, I, I show you guys right away. Um, and so... Just, uh, yeah, in the, in the last 12 months, I've probably spent, um, you know, maybe around $10 million on Facebook and generated over $20 million for my clients. And so I want to take everything that I've learned um, in the last year or so and just show you guys everything today. So um, here's the agenda. Um, so first off, I want to go, we're going to just um, talk about how to develop a funnel strategy, like how to decide what kind of Facebook ads funnel is for you because um, it really depends on your price point and the type of business that you have. Uh, we're going to dive deep into each of the funnels um, and you can, you know, based off the criteria, you can decide uh, which one's best for your business. I'm going to talk about a testing framework, like how, how should you, like when you run ads, like what's the best approach to testing? And that's the approach that, that we use internally. Um, so I'll show you that. And then um, at the end, I'm going to get into conversion rate optimization and scaling, the fun part, okay? So you guys have probably been in this space for a while. So you may have seen this formula. It's um, widely used in the e-commerce space and it's so true and I stand by it and I love it. It's so simple. 
and very true. So it's revenue equals traffic times conversion rate times frequency times average order value. And so when you take each and every, each and every item of this formula and you focus on each and every one, you can really um, you know, dial up and dial down on the ones that need to be focused on. And so when you, after you run ads for a certain period of time and after you have traction and data in your business, you can, you can use each one of these as a KPI and then find out where the weak, or not the weak spot, or I guess like where, where opportunities might be. And so today I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus a lot on the traffic side of things. So Facebook ads, how to drive inexpensive and high quality traffic to your site. I'm also gonna touch on the CR part. So conversion rate optimization. Okay, now let's get started with the traffic part. So mapping out your funnel. Um, and so I'm gonna go through, you know, you guys have already seen this, this is marketing 101. Um, people don't just buy stuff, it doesn't happen. There's a process behind making a decision to purchase something. And it typically goes through, you know, high level is awareness, interest, and then decision-making, okay? And so a, a definition that I like for what a sales funnel is. So a sales funnel is a structured way of guiding human behavior with the goal of making a sale, okay? Um, and so if you look at this slide here, this will tell you, this is just to give you um, an idea of the type of funnel that you should have. And so um, generally speaking, the higher the price point of your product, the longer the sales funnel that you'll need because the more time it'll take to bring someone to the point where they're gonna make a decision, say, hey, I'm gonna buy this. Uh, for example, if you're selling a $1,000 purse, um, someone's not gonna just see it and buy it the first day they see it, unless you're like a brand that they know about and they've seen. Um, and in that case, it's not the first day they've seen you. So um, compared to, let's say you are selling $30 t-shirts, someone might just see it and buy it because it's not a high priced item. There isn't much of a commitment they can just slap it on the credit card and then move on. And so if you're selling inexpensive items or lower price point items around, you know, 20 to $60, $70, um, it's fairly straightforward. And there's, there's not much time it takes for people to make the decision to make the purchase. So you won't need a long sales funnel. You'll need a very basic sales funnel um, with, with just a couple of steps and that should work. But if you have a high price point item, you're going to need a few steps. You're going to need more uh, sophisticated sales funnel. And I'm going to go into each and every one of those right now. Okay. So on the simplest, the simplest sales funnel, the lower price point products, you're going to, you can just have one campaign where it's a top of the funnel campaign. You're targeting prospects, people who you, who don't know you, um, sending them to a landing page, and then you're retargeting them. So it's a simple, simple funnel. It works. And um, yeah, you don't need anything more than this most of the time, okay? Now, let's say it's a higher price point item. You're gonna have, you're gonna need more steps. You're gonna have to nurture them more and warm them up more. So you're gonna have a top of the funnel. You may have a couple of middle of funnels and then um, you'll have a bottom of the funnel, okay? And so um, you're gonna have to just, you know, uh, you know, warm them up to the brand more. You'll, you'll have to put more time into warming them up. So the top of the funnel, you might see like a lifestyle ad. Uh, and then the middle funnel, you might see, you know, like a testimonial or re retargeting them with a testimonial or benefits, really just like drilling in um, the reasons why they should buy and why your product is better than your competitors, really installing that in, installing that in their minds. And then, um, you know, moving forward to the, moving over to the bottom of the funnel. Um, now there's, these three and four, I'm only going to cover number three, um, but three is just like for those like even higher price point items. And so let's say you're selling something at the, you know, for two, 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 two let's say $2,000. Um, what some e-commerce brands do is that they'll, they'll create a lead magnet. So they're not going to try to get the purchase right away. Um, and instead, what they're going to do is they're going to either send you to a sales page where they try to get an email and then nurture you. And then that email goes through like a drip sequence of some sort. And then, um, and then, you know, the same, the same flow where you're retargeting them and then sending out emails. And so, um, and so just like going through like these three funnels, you can see that the higher the price point, the more steps are needed. And you'll have to, depending on what business, whatever you're selling, you'll have to think and devise a strategy that makes sense that you think that that'll help bring your potential customers through that funnel. Okay. Um, 
So let's look at, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna use like the number two. So one of the simpler ones to just go through um, like what that actually looks like when you're setting it up in Facebook ads manager. Um, so you're gonna have stage number one, you're gonna have a uh, conversions campaign. Um, and so this is, you're gonna optimize for conversions, not video views. So I'll correct this and send this to the right one after, but you're gonna have a conversions campaigns and you're gonna use uh, either lookalike audiences or interests or even open targeting in the top of the funnel, okay? Um, and so, and, and, and well, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more what lookalike audiences are for those who aren't already aware of them, but um, that's, that's pretty much what you're gonna have. And so you have tons of options when it comes to targeting in the top of the funnel. And usually you can break it down into three categories. It's lookalikes, interests, and just open targeting, which is no targeting at all. And it actually works. Um, and so here's, here's just more examples of like the options that you'll have in ads manager. Um, so like on a behavior level, you can target people, uh, you can you know, target people based on their education, financial status, life events, um, relationship, work. For interest, you can do so many options. And so the categories are family, relationship, fitness, wellness. You can choose brands. So like brands that you know your potential customers might like, you can choose to target that. Um, so, you know, if you're selling um, beauty products, you can, you can, you can target, um, you know, Glossier and, and other competitors such as that. And then um, it's actually available. So that's pretty amazing. Um, so examples of uh, cold traffic creative, okay? So these are, this is a client um, based out of Miami and they, um, they sell like vacation style uh, clothing, so shorts and shirts. And so these are some, some high converting ads that we had, that we ran for this client. Um, so you see like it's, you know, we are getting playful with this one. We had like this meme style ad. So the perfect week, the perfect weekend shirt doesn't exist. And then you have this dude um, who's clearly proving us wrong that there is a perfect weekend shirt. And so this, this, this performed quite well. Um, and then, oops, yeah. So then this one, like a carousel, carousel style um, with, with, uh, with, uh, yeah, like just like different lifestyle shots. Um, the, these, these work really well in the top of the funnel and targeting cold traffic. Um, so then next, the next stage for retargeting, stage two, we'll call it, um, we can retarget people who visited your website. Um, you know, for this one, we can have, these are a list of audiences that I love using in the, uh, in the middle funnel, um, cause they work, they just work really well. So it's one is engaged with us on Facebook. You can target people who engage with you on Facebook, on Instagram, people who viewed 75% of your video in the last 30 days, um, visited website last 180 days at to cart 180 days, and then top 25 times spent on website last 180 days. Okay. Um, now you, you need to exclude purchasers because you want um, you want this to be cold. Like you don't want to be retargeting customers uh, in these campaigns because these are geared for you know cus new customer acquisition. Okay, so these are um, these are some just more ad creative that we use in the middle of the funnel um, for some of the clients that we're working with. And so this is this is a brand that sells hair removal wax. And then, so what we did here is that, you know, like they, we were able to create a retargeting audience to know like exactly which product that they visited. So in this case, it was this one right here, the large wax warmer. And so we just created this ad where um, um, she's in the, she's in the factory and says, Hey, and she like th somebody throws the box to her and she said, Hey, I saw you checking this out. And then we just, we go in and we just, you know, we list all of our value propositions and the, and we give an offer here. Um, and that usually, that usually works really well. And the same thing, if you look at Mavrans over here, they had, um, you know, a review. Reviews are really good to use in retargeting campaigns. Okay, now we're gonna go to the last stage, the last audience, uh, the bottom of the funnel. Um, and so this is like the hot audience. This is like the, the audience that converts very, very well. So what we're gonna, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna, we're gonna create segments of people who not only visited your site, but showed a lot of intent to purchase when they were on your website. So that's three days added to cart or viewed the product, seven days 
or 30 days. It's top 25% last 60 days. Initiate checkout last 90 days. Uh, and then people who added to cart two times in the last 10 days. So we're going to retarget these, this group of people. And usually this is the, like the highest converting um, uh, campaign that you'll see in your account. And this is, this is a meme that I thought was very fitting for this because we're, tar we're retargeting them on, we're essentially funneling them through. So the top of the funnel, they're engaging with you. And then the middle of the funnel, they're engaging with, and you're retargeting them again. It's just, it's, um, yeah, you just retarget, retarget until they buy. So um, this is, okay, for, for, the, for the bottom of the funnel, the, it's a simple ad that always works. It's just a simple like carousel with an offer. So like this type of thing. And a lot, of, and you can even run this as, as a dynamic ad where, where um, people are dynamically being retargeted with the ad with, with the, um, an ad showing the product that they viewed when they were browsing your site. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into a testing framework. And if you have any questions, you can um, just note them down. We'll have a Q and A at the end. Um, but yeah, so let's dive into this question, this testing framework. Um, so I'll always start off testing, like trying to find the right audience. And so that doesn't mean that creative and offer are not important, but I make sure that I start strong with creative and offer. And how I start strong is that I just research. You can see what everybody else is doing. You can see their ad libraries. You can, um, you can view all of your competitors' ads. And so you can, you can, you can shortcut um, your way to success on the creative side of things by just viewing how your competitors' ads are performing. And so, you know, if you go into your competitor's ad library and you see that they've been running the same ad for the last three months, well, chances are it's performing or else they wouldn't have it live. And so for that reason, I always start off with testing, trying to nail the audiences, trying to find which audience, top funnel audiences will convert best. Um, and I, I'm comfortable doing that, knowing that I've done a good job with creative because creative is so important and um, you don't want to, you don't want to start with, because if you start with bad creative and you're testing bad creative with really good audiences, it won't perform, right? So you only start stage one, start with testing audiences. If you're, if you know, or you're very confident that your creative is, um, is good. Okay. Uh, and so after a series of tests, of trying out different lookalikes, interests and open targeting, um, you know, you're probably gonna you're probably gonna narrow it down to a couple of uh, really good lookalikes and interests that you that you know are the winners. And once once you once you once you nail down those, you can move on and start testing out your offers and your creative. Okay. So the next point that I wanted to talk about was um, conversion rate optimization. So remember the formula at the very beginning. We spoke about the traffic part. Now this is the conversion rate optimization part. So this is this is making sure that it's one thing to send traffic to your, it's one thing to, yeah, to be able to get cheap traffic, but once they get to your site, um, they need to convert. You know, if you have a site with broken links and slow load times and blurry images, like it doesn't matter how good your ad campaigns are. They're not, they're, they're not gonna buy, they're gonna get to your site and leave. Um, so here are just some questions that you want to ask yourself um, to help you get started with conversion rate optimization. Uh, number one is what's your e-commerce conversion rate? How's your page load time? Does your product page have reviews? Does it have a video? You offer free shipping? Is there something you can do to increase average order value? Have you audited your drop-off rates? Okay, so just a quick crash course. So e-commerce conversion rate. So the conversion you get in a given time frame by divided by the total number of people who visited your site or landing page and multiply it by 100. So it's basically the number of people converting or transacting over the total number of visits. Okay, so the page load time, the average time it takes uh, for a page to show up on your screen uh, and then the average order value. Um, so simply divide the total revenue by the total number of orders. Okay, 
Now, this is really important. So if you listen to one thing, listen to this. This is, um, this is an illustration of how important the e-commerce conversion rate is. So this is a calculator we use internally just to run numbers to get, just to see it. It always helps to see the impact because you know it, people people tend to uh, downplay the importance of this. And so um, you know, with all all factors remaining the same, so re revenue target 200k, average order value 100 bucks, number of sales you need, and then um, and then so we basically input the percentage of the website conversion rate, and then it spits out how much ad spend you need in order to hit your goals. Okay. Now just to sum it up. Um, a 1% conversion rate, remember e-commerce conversion rate of 1% is the total number of transactions over visitors. So a 1% conversion rate requires 160K in ad spend to reach 200K in revenue. Whereas if your e-commerce conversion rate, if your website is converting at 3%, then you only need 53K spend to reach that same 200K, okay? So, it's so important. Like, don't even consider running ads unless you know that this is in place because you're just going to waste your money. Okay. Now, where do you get started? Well, if you're using Shopify, you can enable enhanced e commerce and you can see this report. Okay. And you can see where people are dropping off when they're going from. Page to the product pages and the product pages to the add to cart to adding to cart and then add to cart to checking out. So you can see the drop off from each step of your funnel and you don't even need to set it up. You just got to check a box and enable that set up Google analytics and then boom, you'll have this report. Okay. Um, so that's the first thing you'll do. If you ever have any concerns um, around whether or not your website is converting, Go see this report, go look up benchmarks for um, people in your space and then see how you, how, you, uh, how you stand up next to what the average benchmarks look like. And if you're below, then you know you need to fix it, okay? Um, now, this, is, this shows you what's happening, okay? But once you find out, let's say you find out like, oh no, I'm, you know, my, you know, product view to add to cart drop off is suffering. Like there's too many people dropping off. This is where the issue is. Well, what's next? Well, you need to find out why. Now, a great way to find out why is to install heat maps. So using, let's say you're using Shopify. Um, there's a really amazing um, app called Lucky Orange. Just install it. There's like a free seven day trial um, and you can get a heat map. You can view the heat maps of your website. So you see where most of people are clicking. Um, and it also gives you a good indicator where they're looking because usually they're clicking where they're looking. Um, so this is an example of a heat map. Um, and so this is great. The heat maps are awesome, but what's even better and what really gives you the answer as to why people are dropping off is if you look at the session recordings. Now it's kind of creepy because you can actually see people navigating through your website. They're clicking through something. You can see like when they're, you know, reading something, they're like, like you see their mouse, you see everything except for their, you know, obviously their personal data is, is, is uh, hidden. You don't see that. Um, so it's totally legit and it's, it's, it's so insightful. And so you'll learn You'll learn the stuff you'll learn if you if you view these recordings, sit down and watch an hour of recordings on your site and you'll see um, you'll see why people are doing what they're doing and you're, you'll be very surprised with what you find. Okay. Now, um, back to the, the traffic part of things. So I want to talk about the um, scaling. So this is the fun part. Um, so once you have your funnel down, you ran ads, um, and you're seeing good results. Uh, well, what's next? You want to scale, right? Everybody wants to scale. So um, I'm going to talk about a little bit, about, you know, different types of scaling, um, the benefits, and you know, we can get into all the the pros and cons. So 
Um, there's two types of scaling when it comes to Facebook ads. There's vertical scaling, which means you scale by increasing the budget on your existing campaigns. Okay, so if you have something that's doing well, you just increase it a little bit by a little bit every single day. Uh, then there's horizontal scaling where you, you duplicate, you basically create, let's say you have one campaign that's doing really well, you just create a ton more like that. So you'll duplicate five and then change the audiences. So it's the same ads, just different audience. And so let's say you have one campaign spending $100 daily and um, it's doing well and you know, you're confident in your offer and you're creative and you're like, okay, well, it's time, it's time to go, go, you know, you know, go crack, go capture more eyeballs. We need to be seen by more people and we want to grow this. So you'll just duplicate that campaign uh, four times and you'll set, you know, you'll have four additional campaigns spending hundred dollars a day. So 500 total, but for each of the campaigns, you'll just choose a different audience. And that can be a different lookalike. It could be a different interest. It could be the same interest, but just different age, age groups. Maybe you, maybe you're targeting age 20 to 30 and then you want to try 30 to 40 and then 40 to 50. So many ways that you can just slice it up. Um, now, sorry, it's a little bit blurry, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, here, I'll just, so I'll just like get into each of the, like the pros and cons of each um, scaling tactic. So for vertical scaling, um, I'm personally not a fan of it because you, you're basically placing all your eggs in one basket. So Facebook is very, very finicky. So they, some days your campaigns are on fire, the next days they aren't. And so performance just drops for no reason. And so they, when you have, when you're scaling vertically, you're placing all your eggs in one basket because you have one campaign that you're relying on to bring in all of the results for you. And which is great because let's say it's working, you're, you know, you're good, you're happy. But then when that campaign blows a flat tire, you're going to have to create a new one and it might not perform, might not be performed the way your original campaign was performing. So I'm a fan of mixing both strategies. And oh, well, another disadvantage is that it's scales slower. So you, have, you can't, you can't increase a budget from hundred dollars daily on the same campaign, just jack it up to 500 daily and expect it to perform the same. No, you need to, if you're scaling vertically, you need to increase it by 15 to 20% every two, every two, one or two days, um, which takes time, right? Compared to horizontal, you just, you know, in a day, you can just like, you start a new campaigns. You can, you can go from 100 to 500. Um, now, my favorite approach is a mix of both. So I would normally what I'll do is, is like, I'll start off by, by, if I have a campaign that's working, I'll start off by scaling horizontally. So I'll just duplicate it. I'll create a, a whole bunch more. And then, you know, maybe let's say I duplicate it four times, maybe two of them will be losers and two of them will be winners. Good. Now I kill the losers. I keep the winners. I'll do it again. And maybe the same thing will happen. Rinse and repeat. And then after a certain period of time, you'll have, I don't know, 10 winning top funnel campaigns in your account. And then once you have 10, let's, once you have like a lot of eggs in your back, once you have like, you know, your, your, um, your campaign spread out into many campaigns that are performing, um, some will be performing better than others, then start dialing them up. Cause let's say you dial it up and let's say it happens that you dial it up and it throws performance off. Well, you're not that worried. Cause you have 10, you have nine other ones that are performing well for you. So I'm a fan of mixing, like starting off with horizontal and then, um, and then throwing in vertical, like dialing up some of the, some of the winners. Um, now, another component of scaling is, is main, is making sure that your, your, um, your budget is, is split 70% top of the funnel. Okay. And then 30% uh, bottom and middle. Okay, roughly, it could be, you know, could be a little bit more or less, but as a general rule, 70% top of the funnel, 30% middle and bottom. And so as you, let's say you, you dial up your top of the funnel from $100 to 500 daily, you're, you know, you're going to want to increase your middle and the bottom so that, so that you, you maintain the 70, 30 proportion, but you can't do it right away. Because remember, the, 
the top of the funnel is feeding the middle and the bottom, right? So day one, you know, if you increase it from 100 to 500, day one, you only have one, one, one day worth of data that is gathered in your custom audiences in your middle and bottom retargeting campaigns. But so wait, give it a few days, give it a week or so. And then once you've bulked up your middle and bottom funnel, um, once, you, once you've bulked it up, then you can, uh, you can start, you know, turn it up. So just make sure that, you know, you, as you increase your top, give it a few days, then increase your bottom. Um, but it'll, it'll be very important to make sure that your, um, to make sure that your frequency in the middle and the bottom um, doesn't go, doesn't, doesn't reach like, you know, doesn't get too high. Like if, if you, if you're frequent, but when I say frequency, I'm talking about the number of times this same person has viewed the same ad. Um, you want to make sure that that's under control. So you can, you can use frequency to guide your budget. So let's say, say you're, you're doing 70, 30, and you see that your frequency is 10, 30% might be too high, lower it, lower your, lower the, the amount you're spending in the middle or bottom. But the key takeaway here is um, when it comes to um, scaling, um, do a mix of both, run horizontal and then add in vertical and just make sure you're every, every few days, you're also increasing your, your, um, your middle and bottom in equal proportion that you're increasing your top. Okay. Um, so some other stuff that you should know. Um, so don't invent the, the, don't reinvent the wheel. And so, like I was saying earlier, you have, you have so many options when it comes to spying on your competitors, like, cause just list them, go to the ad library and you can view their ads and you can, you can take, you know, let's say your top three competitors, you can find each of their top ads and then take inspiration from that. And, um, you know, obviously you don't want to, you don't want to stick to that. It's not copying competitors, is not a winning strategy. Um, but you want to, you want to take the good and enhance it. So you want to, you want to see what they're doing and then um, bring something even better. So say, okay, I like that, but I'm going to make it better. So enhance, don't, don't copy, enhance. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is, this is a given, but design and write everything for mobile. Now, you know, it's 2020, everybody knows this by now, but you'd be surprised some people, if you see their mobile site, they, they don't QA when you launch, let's say you create a new page, people, some people tend not to QA it, okay? Um, so just make sure everything you're checking mobile, making sure everything looks good. Um, you know, not, not using video ads is like playing a full hockey game shorthanded one man. Now, for those of you from Canada, you might know what that means, but it's basically, um, if you're not using video, you're really, really missing out. Uh, it's so important. So and it's easy. It's easy to get content. Nowadays, you can just um, just reach out, reach out to some of your best customers and say, hey, you bought from me three times. Do you want to send me content? Do you want to make a video, a review of you, you know, what you think of the product, like why you bought it? Um, simple as that. User-generated content works great. Um, you know, and then you can also, there's, there's a lot of studios that produce really nice content for not that much. It's like on-demand studios that you can find. Um, but even, even with just with your phone at home, you, there's tons of options that you can make. So there's no reason not to be running video. Okay. Um, okay. So work with a celebrity. I mean, if possible, it always works better if you can get somebody who's high profile to, uh, to, to, to wear your stuff, to wear your, your, your clothing or to endorse your product, but that's easier said than done. Okay. Um, the last point I want to talk about is pricing. So Facebook is expensive, way more expensive than it was in 2013, 14, um, especially in Q4, especially during election period. So when you price your product, let's say you're, let's say you're new for those of you who are launching um, a lot of brands that I see, newer brands, they don't account for what, they plan on running ads, Facebook ads as their primary um, source of sales, as their primary primary sales channel, but they don't account for what the potential cost would be, uh, cost of advertising will be. So, and they don't bake that into the price of their product. So what happens is they launch and they start running ads and they realize that um, it's not, 
profitable given their like what their cost per purchase is, what their return is, and then they have to find another channel and it puts them in a hard place. So um, if you're if you're new, you're about to launch a brand, um, price your product accordingly. Think about what Facebook, if Facebook's going to be your primary channel, think about what it'll cost and then add that to your, add that to the price because it, it, it is getting expensive. Um, another thing is that if you're starting off, um, you want to start off with at least a couple hundred dollars a day budget. So if you, if you're going to spend like, if you want to start off with a 20, $30 a day budget, you're you're going to have a hard time because it's going to take you so long to get results and to make conclusions and to optimize. And another thing is that when I say optimize, that's the key word because Facebook requires a certain amount of conversions for it to start optimizing and for your care campaigns to start improving. And so if you're going to start out, try to set up a budget for at least a couple months, three, two to three months um, for, for two to three, you know, anywhere from, let's say a hundred, to two to $300 a day um, to really get a feel of what your conversions look like and to give yourself a fair shot at succeeding with running ads on Facebook. Now, these are just some tools that I love and that I always use. So Pix Facebook Pixel uh, Helper, the Chrome extension, so you can view like which, which events are firing off. Uh, Lucky Orange for conversion rate optimization, Lumen5 for video. Facebook audience insights to research your uh, to research and find interests. Page transparency, that's the uh, competitor research. So if you just go to your competitors' Facebook pages, you can see if you go to like, um, I think it's like view more about this product, this brand, so like in the right corner, you can see all their ads. Um, and then similar web, if you wanna get an idea of like what their traffic looks like, if they're growing, go to similar web, they have, uh, um, uh, just like general website analytics that you can view. Um, yeah, so now it's Q and A time. Uh, so any questions that you have, like, please go ahead and ask. And if, if you don't have, if you can't get your question in, just email me and then, yeah. So I'll leave the floors for you guys. Okay. Very well. So I actually learned a few things there too, Kevin. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, let's see here. Chats. Question one. Are heat maps good for measuring mobile traffic? Phones, tablets, etc. Yeah, yeah, you can you can view heat maps on mobile. Um, you can view session recordings on mobile. It's the same. It's just as good as desktop. Um, and you'll often find that on mobile that the heat map um, gets really cold towards the bottom of the screen because um, it's smaller, right? So you have to scroll more to get to the bottom. And whereas on desktop, like more, more of your homepage or more of whatever page you're on is, is shown. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's equally valid. Like they're, they're, it's very useful for both mobile and desktop. Okay, let's see here. We've got another question for you. What are three actionable steps to take in successfully launching a new product? This is a small fashion brand in business for one year. Yeah. So, I mean, on the product side of things, obviously like this is, um, you know, before even running ads, you know, you have to do obviously research and, and, you know, interview and surveys to get um, insight from your potential customers. Um, but on the Facebook ad side of things, um, you know, I, in the last bit of that presentation, I mentioned like starting off with a, a budget size of anywhere from 100 to 300 daily. Um, I'd say like if you're going to run ads, um, try to start off with a decent budget size so that you can really collect data and get customers, um, especially if your price point is, let's say it's over $100. Um, Another thing is, is um, a lot of brands go into it with sort of like this, um, you know, okay, my website's half complete. It's not, you know, I don't have, I don't have the, um, you know, I don't have the images that I want. And so the website's sort of like half finished. I'd say like, it's really important to have really high quality images and, um, you know, invest, invest in a, in a designer if you need to, um, like don't, 
don't launch the brand if the website doesn't look finished. And so it's, it's, it's especially with drop shippers, um, with the increase in popularity of drop shipping, it's become, um, it's become, you, you can have a Shopify up in a day. And so that's what happens a lot of times with drop shippers. Um, and so it's important to really invest in the site to really make sure it's credible, make it look like you, you've done a lot of work and that it's very professional because that makes all the difference. Okay, we have one more here for you. Instagram, oh, this is a, this is a good question. Holy grail. Uh, Instagram and Facebook versus Google ads, what to choose? I'd say if you had to choose one to start off with, I'd start off with, with Facebook. Um, yeah, absolutely. Start off with Facebook and Instagram um, because it's a better top funnel, top of the funnel channel. And so what I mean by top of the funnel is that um, you can use strong visuals to tell a story. And so, whereas like Facebook, whereas on, that's on Facebook and Instagram and to tell a story and to introduce people to your brand. Um, whereas on Google, it's more of an intent folk intent based platform where people are actually searching for stuff to buy. So they're going to search out, you know, buy purse online, buy this type of clothing, um, or they'll actually Google your brand name. Uh, and then sh and you'll show up for that. And then, so yeah, like if you're a newer brand, I'd say for sure, for sure, start off, prioritize Facebook as your initial marketing channel. Um, and then roll out Facebook later on, uh, uh, Google later on, once you've, once you, once you start seeing a bit of traction, but ultimately um, down the road, the optimal, like the best answer, like ultimately down the road, you want to have both channels live because um, they'll work together in completing or helping people through the funnel. Because remember the ads funnel that I was going through at the beginning of the presentation? Well, that funnel, that's a, that's a funnel specifically on Facebook but that applies to your entire marketing funnel in general. So, so remember the bottom funnel campaigns that I was, we were going over, you we spoke about, you're going to use face, you're going to use Google as your bottom funnel. It's going to help you convert people. So the journey is going to be, they're going to be seeing you on Facebook or Instagram. They'll be coming aware of you. They might search for you on Google. They'll find your Google ad. They'll visit you again. And then maybe you'll retarget them through Facebook and then they'll buy. So, so yeah, if you had to prioritize budget, don't spread yourself thin by going everywhere. Start with Facebook and Instagram, but the end game and the ultimate goal is to be running both because um, there'll be a multiplier effect and both channels work work well together in helping people buy. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, but it seems like in my experience, the uh, the Facebook platform, it gives you more bang for your buck from a budgeting standpoint. Um, you know, uh, what, what I've experienced with Google ads is that you need a pretty decent sized budget on a monthly basis to really compete against all these other ad accounts that have their own devoted um, ad teams that are specializing in things like keywords. And it's just a much more involved process, it seems, on Google than it is on Facebook. Yeah, I, I mean, I depends. Like I, I have, I work with some of my clients and we're getting the same results like Facebook and Google, we see around the same return. Um, but if for, for newer brands, I'd say, yeah, uh, Facebook and Instagram is probably better bang for the buck. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions here. What percentage should you include in your costing for apparel for marketing? How much should you spend on marketing as a minimum for a small sp startup with a limited resources price points, 30 to a hundred dollars. Not sure if they mean per, per what unit of time, but yeah. Yeah. See what you can do with that. Um, yeah. So like, let's say your um, let's say your price point is like $30. Um, you know, you, you might be, you know, with through Facebook ads, if you have a, if you um, if you have an optimized campaign, you know, it's, it's safe to say that uh, you might get a two X return if, if, if you're if your campaigns are optimized. So that would be a, 
you know, for every $15 spent, you get one purchase of $30, which equates to 2x return. So yeah, I mean, you, you'll need to, you'll need to, um, you'll need to like consider that when crafting your campaigns. Um, and so let's say you're, but let's say your cost per purchase is $15 and then your product is 50. Um, you know, that's even, that, that's an even better return. So it's, it, it really depends. Like I, but I, if you want to, if you want to have just like a starting point, um, you know, tell yourself that maybe you might be getting a 1.5 to two X return on your ad spend. Um, and then, then work the numbers out, like based on what your average order value might be, because maybe, Maybe that one product is 30 bucks, but maybe they'll check out with like an upsell of something that's 20 bucks, right? Um, so remember the, remember the equation in the beginning where it's traffic times conversion rate times average order value. Um, yeah, so like the average, like if you can, if you can increase your average order value, then that, that also, that improves your, your return and helps with your margins. So it's all, yeah, there's just so many factors looked at, but to, to simplify it, um, starting off as a number to have in your mind, you might, you know, you might get 1.5 to two X return on ad spend. And then, so take that. And when you're, when you're pricing your products, just keep that in mind. Okay. Next question is thank you for the info and understanding as a startup and designer who only wants to design and who has to worry about things like manufacturing orders, et cetera, this can be overwhelming. Who can assist with a low budget? Um, well, if you, yeah, like, I mean, I always recommend to prospects or people interested in running ads that if you have a low budget, it's not a, not a good idea to hire an agency um, because you're going to pay more in management fees than you're going to be paying in ad spend. So the first thing is, is do not work with an agency. Um, second thing is, is if you want to, if you want to run ads, then you, but you're too busy, then either maybe find a freelancer or somebody you can trust who's, who's knowledgeable about this. If you have a family member or a friend, um, who can freelance for you. Um, but there is a bit of expertise required. So it's, you know, you know, you might not, you, you might not be able to, you, you won't be sure that you're getting the best results possible. So in that case, if you're just starting out, maybe learn it yourself. Take take a couple hours a week, take a couple courses, learn it yourself, and then once you're once you're fluent enough in it, you'll be able to you'll be able to um, assess whether or not somebody's doing a good job or not. Then you can hire a friend or a freelancer to help you out with it, and then hire an agency once you get to the next level, and then you wanna you wanna outsource it. Yeah, that's a good point, Kevin, about um, kind of understanding the basics. You don't have to be an expert on how Google ads work, but getting familiar with the platform and some of the metrics and the key performance indicators uh, and just the, the targeting options is something that you'll certainly need, even if you are working with an agency, because, you know, it's when, when they when they present you with this information, you need to know what you're looking at. So it, it uh, and, and, and Facebook does have um, the Facebook blueprint, right, the training program where you can actually learn about this stuff. Right. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. So there, there are resources there. Yeah. Yeah. There's Udemy. Um, Udemy is yeah. really great, actually, for, for that kind of stuff. Oops. Yeah. There's tons of resources out there. So, um, do Facebook ads automatically cross over to Instagram ads as well? Good question. Yeah. It's the same platform. When you're setting up the campaigns on the ad set level, you can you can you know check box off wherever you want it to run. So you can choose Facebook or Instagram or both. You can choose like the feed or Facebook store, uh, Instagram feed or Instagram stories. You can you can select that all uh, when setting up the campaign. Be mindful of the ad dimensions. What works in uh, uh, Facebook won't always work on Instagram. So um, exactly, yeah, yeah. Be yeah. be mindful of that. Um, is it possible to make ads all at once and deploy over time, or does this make it impossible to adapt based on learning? Um, I'm not quite sure what. 
I, I think she's asking. So, I mean, there's, there's the Facebook ads manager where you can create a whole bunch of ads all at once. Uh, and then you can schedule them to go out at different times. I think that's what she's asking. Okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Uh, well, Kevin, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. So when you, so when you schedule ads, um, so when you, you can schedule posts like on your, on your Instagram account, um, and in your Facebook page, you can schedule posts. Um, and then if you want to schedule ads, you can also schedule ads to launch. Um, and then, yeah, like, but you know, like if you want to, if you want to, you know, you, when you launch a campaign, you're only going to start off with maybe, um, you know, seven to 10 ads and, uh, but yeah, like for, for scheduling, a lot of the scheduling I, I do is through, um, you know, when it comes to posting on the page and on the account. Yeah. And, and then I guess, uh, I think she might be asking in terms of it, 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 it's not beneficial if you're doing AB testing to see what works. If you just create a bunch of content and then schedule it out for a month, for example, it might be more advantageous to create campaigns with, like you said, uh, five to 10 ads and see how they perform. And then, you know, start tweaking it from there. I think is what yeah. she was, uh, I think is what she was asking. Yeah. 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 You can, I mean, you can schedule all of your campaigns for a month, but the thing is like what, you know, after week one, you're going to have learned a lot from, from, from the campaigns of the previous week. You're going to learn like which audience performed best, which creative did, which offers. Um, so you don't, you maybe don't want to schedule the next week's campaign to launch because um, by the end of week one, that what you think, what you think might be a good campaign number two might totally be different because you're always learning and, and optimizing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does TikTok work uh, for a higher end audience and price point? Higher end, TikTok. probably in terms of uh, like luxury, more like a higher end price point. Yeah. Yeah, TikTok. Um, it's a very new, um, uh, like ad platform. So I, we're part of the beta, the beta agency, beta program for TikTok, and we've ran ads on TikTok. It's extremely cheap, very inexpensive, um, but they're still working on their platform. They're still working on building their advertising engine, if you want to call it that. Um, so it's still, it's still very new. Um, no, nobody's, nobody's really sure what to make of it yet. Um, but we know that it's cheap and I'm sure it's going to be, I'm sure it's going to be a powerhouse ad platform, um, at some point, but, um, but yeah, you know, it, and, and it really depends on your product. Uh, it really, yeah, it really depends on your product. If you, if you can create a challenge or create content, uh, if your product is, you know, the type of product that, you know, you can create content around and challenges and, and, you know, content that will be shared and watched, then yeah, TikTok is, you can probably, you can probably do really well on TikTok organically without even running ads. Fantastic. All right. Um, will your marketing strategy work for, and will be, would it be the same strategy for the end consumer versus a supplier? I think she's talking um, about one step back in the supply chain. Okay. If you're okay. a supplier, um, would this would this marketing strategy work? Yeah. Well, for a supplier, well, yeah. Well, for a supplier, you your customers would be like retailers, right? Um, so you. Yeah, I looking, think that's what she's asking. Yeah. Yeah. So you would, as a supplier, if you're looking for customers, like your customers would be the Shopify owners and the boutiques then you would probably want to run lead gen campaigns because um, they won't transact. They, you know, they, it won't be a transaction that they make on your site, but you'll probably want to just run campaigns where you send them to a landing page and, uh, and they book a call with you to go over, you know, to find out more about your, your, your MOQs and lead time and fabrics and just all the information that people usually ask. Um, so it'll be more of a lead gen campaign and, and yeah, it, it you it probably will work with Facebook ads with the right strategy. Um, and so to answer your question, um, uh, the funnels that from this presentation um, are for e-commerce, and they wouldn't really apply to you because you would be running lead gen. 
Um, and so your funnel would just be a simple um, ad campaign to landing page. And the landing page has a, a form, like a, a form out, form to fill out. So it would all it would be one of the it would be one of the simpler ones, like the short ones. It wouldn't be like the long, complicated one. Um, but everything else remains the same for like the targeting and the audiences and, and the scaling. That's all relevant to you. Okay. I don't know if this pertains to ads, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is it risky doing a one SKU business? Is it better to have more SKUs? How many are ideal to increase basket size? Um, yeah, I mean, if you have one SKU, it's always it's always easier easier if it's a like a novel product, if it's a novelty, if it's if it's something really unique, like you you know like you know like those like Kickstarter projects that go viral and they're like one, they're most of them are like, just like one, one product sites. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the reason behind this success, in my opinion, is just the novelty of, of the product. A lot, of, a lot of time it's just like inventions and like stuff that hasn't been seen before. And so if you're going to go with one SKU, um, you know, it's better, you'll, you'll be probably way better off if, if it's, if there's some novelty to the product, if it's something new, something different, um, and also price point, like you want it to, you know, you don't wanna, you wanna have it around $50 up. Like you wanna make sure your average order value isn't, isn't low. Um, so yeah, I'd say like price point, try to keep it over 50 and make sure if you're gonna go with one SKU, make sure it's just something very, very novel and with vi kind of viral uh, prospects. Okay. What is a good way to draw traffic to your Facebook page? What are some ways we can do this? To drive traffic to the Facebook page? Mm -hmm. um, well, if you want to drive, tra what would be the reason to drive traffic to the Facebook page? Can, can you ask a question? Can I ask a question back? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Aftab, that's uh, that, that question is directed to you. Uh, what would be the reason for directing traffic to your Facebook page? Uh, I, I think it, I think overall it would be probably be brand, brand awareness if I could guess if that's what he's trying to get at. Um, trying to get more engagement on that Facebook page. Perhaps it's taking a uh, place of a website. I don't know, but um, I, I, th there is functionality in Facebook to get the ads directed to your Facebook page. Right, yeah. Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. So. So the reason why I was asking why is just because um, you, if you're selling a product, um, like definitely send them to the, to the website, don't send them to the page. Um, so just as a best practice, try to, if that was the plan, avoid that, send, send them directly to the website. Um, but if you don't have a website um, and you wanna send them to the page, um, you can, you can like you can run a engagement campaign. Engagement is uh, an objective uh, alternative to conversions, and it essentially you're targeting. It's a way of targeting people who um, who uh, engage pretty much people who like, comment, share, and visit your profile, your page. Okay, uh, I'm going to hire a creative team to shoot creative. Uh, should it be done all at once the whole year or might the creative need to change so better to split into four shoots? So I guess she's asking, she's going to hire somebody to do photo shoots. Should she do it all in one go or to change things up? Should she do it uh, spread out through about four shoots versus one for the year? Yeah, um, it depends on your collections. So if you have a spring, fall, winter styles collections coming out. So Obviously, if you have collections that depend on the season, you'll do it in four and four four different shoots. Um, but from a cost perspective, you maybe you'll pay less if you do it all in one shot. Um, so, yeah, I it would totally. I, I guess it would depend on how much, you know, how much it'll cost for one versus four, um, and also depends on the collections that you have coming out. Uh, another dependency would be. Uh, on the products that you have coming out. Um, so if, you, if you're introducing 
if you're introducing like new product lines, uh, then maybe you want to wait till to spread them out so that you can introduce more products in, in the new shoots. Yeah, and talk to your photographer. Sometimes they'll they'll cut you a deal if they know they're going to get four, you know, four different bits of business versus just one. So they might not charge you the full amount they would charge on one shoot. They might give you a discount if they know they're going to get guaranteed business for four throughout the year. I've I've certainly worked with photographers that do that. So I'm just ask them. So it's generally a good strategy to negotiate. Okay, um, that's all the questions we have. So, um, Kevin, do you have any final closing remarks? Um, well, no, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate everyone watching. Um, thanks for all the questions. Those are great questions. And um, yeah, um, hope everybody has a good rest of the week. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Yeah. I knew you were going to get a bunch of questions as well. Very relevant uh, information you have here. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Kevin. Thank you, everybody, who's uh, watching right now. Uh, just a quick reminder, we do have the uh, live Hangout uh, access is the bottom right hand of your screen uh, on the main dashboard for the virtual trade show. Um, also, check out the exhibitor hall. Um, that's where you can go. It's basically the show floor is what those two functions are. So um thank you again kevin and we'll see everybody in our final seminar coming up here shortly all right cheers thanks guys bye take care